All right, so we have to get to Job 38. Um, so we spent time in Job chapter 2, two weeks ago, Job 23 last week. Last week was important because, um, because Job, Job gave us um, a clear understanding of what his, what his case against God is. Um, we said last week the thing that Job desires most is, a, is an encounter. Is, is the presence of God. He doesn't want his things back. Not yet. Not at that stage. All he's saying is, I just want to feel something. Just want a sign that indeed God does exist. And if he exists, that at least he cares enough to answer. Well, Job gets his wish. 37 chapters later. Uh, there's a good movie. Uh, it's called A Serious Man. It's a modern retelling of the story of Job. It's about a good Jewish professor of physics in 1960s America um, who gets home after work one day and his wife leaves him. Um, and his daughter is stealing money from his wallet for a nose job and his son is smoking marijuana. Um, and then a student at work bribes him for better marks and he gets caught out so he loses his position. And then he goes to the doctor and he's got a tumor but he doesn't know whether it's a problem. And then all these things happen and it just gets worse and he keeps saying all the time, I didn't do anything to deserve this. And then on the day the doctor phones, a massive storm starts brewing in the distance. Before the doctor can give him the news, the storm comes over. That's kind of where Job is. He's sitting with all this hurt, all this confusion. He's saying, I didn't do anything to deserve any of this. And just when you think he's going to get his breakthrough, the storm comes over the horizon. And, uh, and Job learns to be careful what you wish for. If you want an audience with God, you better gird up your loins. Then out of the storm, the Lord spoke to Job. Who are you? To question my wisdom with your ignorant, empty words. Now stand up straight and answer the questions I ask you. Don and I had a chuckle before. We should have the King James Version today. The King James Version says, gird up your loins. That meant in, uh, in Job's time, men wore um, frocks, uh, uh, long dresses. And when you were getting ready for physical activity, warfare or plowing or something, you would take the ends of your dress and tuck it into your belt. You're girding up your loins so that it doesn't get in the way while you're, while you're running. It's like kicking off your flip-flops before you start moving furniture. You know, otherwise, you fall over. Gird up your loins. Make yourself ready. Warm up. And then you answer me. Were you there when I made the world? If you know so much, tell me about it. Who decided how large it would be? Who stretched the measuring line over it? Do, do you know all the answers? These are rhetorical questions. We know the answer. No, Job doesn't know. Job wasn't there. Who holds up the pillars that support the earth? Who laid the cornerstone of the world? In the dawn of that day, the stars sang together and the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Can you shout orders to the clouds and make them drench you with rain? And if you command the lightning to flash, will it come up to you and say, at at your service? Who tells the ibis when the Nile will flood? Who tells the rooster that rain will fall? Who is wise enough to count the clouds and tilt them over to pour out the rain? Rain that hardens the dust into lumps. Do you find food for lions to eat? And satisfy hungry young lions when they wait in their caves or lie in wait in their dens? Who is it that feeds the ravens when they wander about hungry, when their young cry to me for food? This is the word of the Lord. Yes, thanks be to God. This is God speaking. These are not words about God. This is God's answer to everything that Job had been saying for 36 chapters. All the wrongs committed. All the injustices endured. Job wants answers. Uh, now, uh, as part of our training, we had to do pastoral, pastoral care work. Um, and, and you receive training in that as you receive training in, in anything. There's a, there's a book that you read, an exam that you write. 
Then there's also a practical exam that you sit. And uh, in their wisdom, our professors decided that it was uh, probably not good to send these untrained young ministers out into the hospitals to do pastoral care. They'll, they'll do more harm than good, which is, which is true. So we had a, so we had a professor um, who said, well, you need some kind of practical experience. I'll tell you what, this is now in the class setting. I will, I, I've brought someone along who's very sick and I'm going to bring him in and, and I want you to come up one by one to the, to the chair and I want you to, to minister to him. Pastoral care and the rest of us will, will take notes. Okay, and I mean, what choice do you have? So we all said, okay, that sounds, that, that sounds good. So, so the lecturer left, a uh, big, strong man, uh, big, big barrel chest, even into his old age. Um, and, he, and, and he left and he came back wearing this little blanket over his shoulder, walking hunched over like so. And he got to his desk and he moved his books and he lay down on his table in the fetal position without saying a word and after about 10 minutes I think we all kind of got the hint and so the first guy got up and went, went to go do the pastoral ministry um, uh, and first guy got up and he said hello sir uh, I'm so and so I'm a minister and um, I've, I've come to I've come to care for you and the lecturer said, go away, I don't want to see anyone. And that's what he said to every single one of us. We all failed the exam. <laughs> one girl in the class, well, she went last, so she had a bit of an advantage. <laughs> she, um, she just went and she pulled up a chair and she just sat next to him. And didn't say anything. And she passed. She sat didn't say anything. She just sat. She didn't listen because he wasn't speaking. She just sat in silence, deafening silence, beautiful silence, sacred. Now, if I may be so bold, God missed that class as well. <laughs> because when he answers Job's suffering, he doesn't keep quiet. He doesn't even answer Job's questions. He does something that for us seems very callous, very, very inappropriate. He takes Job's suffering and it seems as if he's saying, Job, let's just get it straight. You're not that important. I've got bigger things to deal with. I've got a creation to maintain. Rain, wind, foundations. Do you know about these things? You don't. So Job, know your place. and Don't think of yourself as the center of the world. We could read this answer of God in that way. I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. That's one way we could read it. And perhaps we'll... Perhaps we should spend some time exploring why God says these things. But before we get there, next, next, next slide, there's an image that has always helped uh, scholars of the book of Job think about what is happening in the book, right from the beginning through to the end. It's known as the triangle of tension. You find it in many different, different disciplines. But, but, but here we have three statements, not only found in the book of Job, but in the thinking of the people in that time in general. Only two of them can be true at the same time. You can only have two. You have to throw the one away. Right? So let's quickly do this little exper experiment. Down in the corner, God is good. Other corner, Job is righteous. Top, a good God rewards a righteous person. You can only have two. Job says, I'm righteous. I have not sinned. I have not deserved this punishment. So that's the one that he gets right. He has to decide between a good God rewards the righteous or God is good. And it seems like Job is stuck in this thinking that says somehow a good God is supposed to reward righteous people. Now, if I know I'm righteous and I know a good God would reward righteous people, that must mean God's not good. 
That's the line of Job's thinking. Job's friends have it the other way around. Job's friends say, God is good. God rewards righteous people. Job, if you're not being rewarded, that much, that must mean you're not as righteous as you think. So Job's friends have the easy, have the easy one to deal with. They say, well, God's good. God rewards righteous behavior. Job, if you're suffering, it must be because you're not righteous. Right at the end of the book, a fourth friend shows up on the scene. He speaks to Job as well. He's got a bit more nuance. He seems to understand that these things are all intention, but he doesn't get it completely right either. And then chapter 38, God comes on the scene and it's like God takes this piece of paper that's got this triangle written on and he tears it out and he uh, uh, rumples it up and he says, I don't work according to your standards, orders, expectations, rules, regulations. I don't abide by your thoughts of what a good God should be like or act like or reward people like. This does not apply to the God of the Bible. That's a difficult thing for us to understand. We like order. We like looking at the vastness of creation and seeing or discerning some kind of order. And then we like distilling that order down into smaller and smaller and more manageable and more manageable parts so that we may direct our own lives according to these elements and parts of order, because we think that will give us some kind of surety, some kind of direction, some kind of ability to at least plan for, if not predict, what's going to happen in the future. That's not a bad thing. The reason we're here today is because our ancestors had the ability to put things in place, to identify and discern, discern the orders of the universe, seasons, when to sow, and when to reap, when to build, and when to tear down, when to hunt, and when to domesticate. But we must understand that God does not play according to our rules. And if we are comfortable saying that, the next thing we must say is that our suffering, as deep and as hurtful and as terrifying as it is for us, is not for God the main concern of creation. That doesn't mean he doesn't care. It means that somehow the suffering you are sitting with now is a suffering for which there are no easy answers. And for a long time in church, we have kept people captive in their pain by giving them easy answers to their suffering. There are no easy answers. Jesus is not a cup of instant soup that you add some water to and then presto, you've got it. Jesus is not the flavoring you pour over your life and it all tastes a bit better. There is no single prayer, there is no single Bible verse, there is no single moment that will, that, will, that will give you the understanding for the pain you're going through. And if nothing else, that's what the book of Job is about. It is that life is unbelievably messy and random and terrifying. And all of the order and all of the chaos belong to God. We actually had Job 38 early in this year. I don't know if you remember. June, July, thereabouts. We had this exact passage. And we said then that what the message from the book, from the chapter is, is that order and chaos belong to God. Action and consequence belong to God. God is not only the God of the good things and the healing and the restoration. God is also God of those things that we don't like to associate him with. The chaos and the disorder and the dysfunction and the randomness and the danger and the cruelty and the suffering and the pain. And so that's handy. Until you get to chapter 38 and God says, do away with it. 
Don't try and box me in. Don't try and understand me according to your triangles. Something else. There's something more important. There's something that happens here in this passage. Just go back to the passage, Rayleigh, first slide. That has an echo in the Gospels. Now, I don't always like mixing the Old Testament and the New Testament unnecessarily, but today I think, I think it's, 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 it's valid. You could count how many times in this passage God is asking the rhetorical question, who are you to tell me? Where were you when I did these things? Can you do what I do? Can you step into the place of judgment? Job was very proud of his ability to judge. In Job's time, if you were a well-respected, wise, righteous, wealthy man, your job was to sit at the gates of the city, under the shade, you and your friends, maybe you're playing dominoes or keeping yourselves busy, and people brought their petty disputes to you. So if someone had a goat that broke into your vineyard and started eating your grapes, then you and your neighbor and the goat would come to these wise men seated at the, at the, at the city gate, and you'd bring the case, and you'd state your case, and they would give you some kind of answer. Pay this man so many bags of olives, or so many bags of wheat, or whatever the case may be. Job liked his place as a judge in his town. That's why he wants God to give him a day in court, because he knows how legal disputes work. And yet God says to him, hang on, where were you? Who are you? Can you pass this judgment? Job will say, well, no, I can't. Now, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's told his disciples once or twice about what's going to happen in Jerusalem, his arrest and his crucifixion, also his resurrection and the coming kingdom of God. And two of his disciples, James and John, the two brothers, they come up to him. They're walking along. They pull Jesus to the back. They want some time alone. And as they're walking, he say, they say to him, Lord, in this new kingdom, uh, we've got, we want to ask you something. We want to sit at your right and at your left hand. Those were the places of, of authority. Those are the places that identified you with the king with the ruler. So Lord, you've told us a lot about this new kingdom. We're excited. We're on your side. We're your disciples. We know it's coming, this big revolution you've been talking about. In this new dispensation, in this new government, we want to be your two deputies. We want the places of honor. Can you give it to us? Jesus doesn't say no. Jesus turns to them and says, can you, can you drink the cup from which I will drink? Can you order the rain? Can you care for creation? It's Jesus' way of asking an, an age-old question to believers. To say, can you truly can you honestly say that you understand the ways of God? It's a, difficult to, it's a difficult place to be in faith. It's difficult for us to honestly, to believe, to be convinced that we are in relationship with God that he holds us in his hands and that no powers and principalities can ever take us from his love and his glory and his mercy. It's difficult to believe and to, to be convicted of that and to have in our lives inexplicable suffering and confusion and disorder. And it seems as if the book of Job is trying to say to us, don't try to reconcile the two. Don't try to diminish the pain you feel 
by expecting some kind of reward for your righteousness. In those pastoral care lessons that we used to take, there was a, a, there was a case study of, um, of a woman who was, who was terminally ill for a long time. She had a long time to deal with her, with her coming death. Her son was a pastor. Um, and he went to go visit her shortly before she died. And she had a terrible long road of suffering. And he tells the story that he sat by her side and she was a church-going woman all her life long, wonderful relationship with, relationship with the Lord. Um, and, and, and she said to her son, while she's in this place, in this hospital bed, she said to him, I don't know what I could have done to deserve this. I think we've all felt that way. I'm not talking about that feeling of incredulity at suffering. I'm talking about that feeling of deep, deep, thinking about our lives. She said to her son, I don't know what I could have done. I don't know what could have been so bad that I would deserve this. The only thing I can think of is that I loved my children more than I loved God. And perhaps that is what God is punishing me for. We have soothed each other with those kinds of thinking about reward and punishment in church for too long. We have covered up massive, gaping, mortal wounds with little band-aids of Bible verses for too long. We live these... <laughs> These, these double lives in which we are happy in front of people, but we are absolutely shattered in our souls, in our private lives. Because we have never dealt with and we have never been led in the one place that's supposed to do it, to deal with our pain, our disappointment, our feeling of really being handled unjustly. This is no small thing. And you might think, oh well, yes I have some suffering, but it's not as bad as Job's. Job's suffering is not some kind of standard. Job's suffering is a story about the one man who actually does have a case to say, I didn't deserve any of this. And when God speaks, he says, you don't understand what you're talking about. Words like deserve, retribution, vengeance, reward. They must mean something else to God than they do to us. So, can you? Can you, can you say... Can you honestly say that you want the answer to your pain? Job will say, be careful. Maybe, it, maybe, it's, maybe it's better to hold the two in balance, life and suffering, and not try and reconcile or diminish the one with the other. Perhaps as a last, as a last part, uh, back to back to Leonard Cohen. Um, perhaps the answer to the question "Can you?" is simply "Hineni." It's not a yes. It's simply "Here I am." Perhaps the questions of God are not about us giving them answers. Perhaps the questions of God are about us girding up our loins, standing up straight. Being ready, ready to receive, ready to learn, ready to be, to, be, to, to be reprimanded, perhaps, refuted, rebuked. Perhaps that word that we find so seldom in the Old Testament is something of a prayer for each of us. Perhaps faced with our own broken lives, 
Perhaps all we should say is, Hineni, here I am. I'm ready, my Lord.